Good morning, afternoon or evening, and welcome to this webinar on the use of bone markers in osteoporosis therapy monitoring in Asia Pacific. I'm Dominique Pierrot, Science Manager at IOF, and I'm happy to moderate this webinar. Before introducing the speaker of the day, I would like to inform you that attendees are automatically muted. I also would like to encourage you to ask questions during the webinar by typing your question into the question box of the GoToWebinar control panel. I will voice the question to the speaker towards the end of this webinar. This being said, I'm happy to introduce our speaker, Dato Dr. Lee Jun Kyung from Malaysia. Dr. Lee is consultant orthopedic surgeon and deputy medical director at Beacon International Specialist Center and Advanced Neuroscience and Orthopedic Center in Malaysia. He is a recognized expert both in the Asia Pacific region and abroad, and he is very active in different alliances and associations within the region. Dr. Lee, please, we are listening to your lecture. Thank you very much, Don, and uh, good afternoon, everybody and all my friends. Thanks for taking your time off to join me in this webinar on bone turnover markers. First of all, I'd like to declare that I have nothing, uh, no conflict of interest to declare for my presentation. Next slide. Dominic. Yes, it's not moving. Yes, a second. Yeah, next slide down. Yes. This next slide. No, yeah. not moving. Yeah, yeah, next slide. Okay. Next slide. Now I have decided to divide this session into three parts. And part one. And I think we know that some of us have used bone turtle markers routinely in our clinical practice, and some knows about it but do not use it routinely. And in many Asian countries, many of us have not used it before, and thinking that bone turtle markers is only used for research purposes. But also some of us believe that bone turtle markers has a role in their clinical practice, but plan and plan to actually start using it uh, in their daily practice. So it is important for, I think, this session to introduce the Ubuntu markers to our colleagues and friends, particularly those who are still quite new to Ubuntu markers, so that you understand the different important points that we need to know. At the same time, we also give a few examples on the response of um, different anti osteoporosis treatment with Ubuntu markers. Whereas part two, we're going to highlight the issues on the adherence and compliance of using bone turnover markers, uh, you know, in terms of clinical practice, particularly for treating those uh, being treated with bisorcinate. We know that bisorcinate used to be and also still be uh, first line of treatment, but there's a big problem on the adherence and compliance. So we're going to discuss about the trial trial and also the IOF ECTS recommendation on the use of bone turtle markers in clinical practice. And our part three, we're going to look at the different clinical guidelines on the use of bone turtle markers in various Asia Pacific countries, where a paper on the consensus statements have been published last year. It was led by Professor Wu and his team from Taiwan in a group of this region and which is a very important paper in terms of consensus statement on using bone turtle markers in this region. Next. Next. Now, let's look at the bone remodeling process first. And we know that the bone remodeling or turnover process involves bone resorption and formation process. And postmenopausal osteoporosis is due to increase in bone turnover process with the imbalance between the bone resorption and formation. Next down. And bone markers or biomarkers are being released 
during the bone resorption process. And these markers we call it uh, bone resorption markers. Whereas similarly, bone biomarkers also released during the bone formation process. And these biomarkers are called bone formation markers. As indicated in this slide here, there are actually the like CTX, NTX, which is released during the resorption process. There are PNMP and others are released during the formation uh, process. Next. Yeah, Dominic, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, the second. Next. This table shows the different markers ASA that can be done in a clinical practice. And particularly on CTX, which is a better cross lab, and a P1MP as indicated there. And I would like to actually bring your attention to this, uh, particularly the features of, for both the CTX and P1MP, where you can see that P1MP are not affected by the food intake. It has a smaller circadian rhythm effect on it. So in practice, Many of us, although we treat the patient in the anti-resorptive, we would like to use the resorption marker changes, but many actually use PNMP because it is less affected by the food intake as well as the circadian rhythm changes. Next. CTX is actually uh, a better cross lab. It's a carboxy terminal telepeptide of type 1 collagen which is the most abundant bone protein. It is actually one of the collagen degradation products that release into circulation during the re bone resorption process. And CTX is actually the reference bone resorption markers recommended by IUF and ISCC. Next. Whereas PNMP is released during the bone formation process. During the formation of type 1 collagen process, the type 1 pro-collagen in which a pro-collagen type 1 N terminal are cleaved and released into the circulation. And again, like CTX, serum PNMP is a reference bone formation marker recommended by IOF and IFCC. Next. This table again show the difference or the highlight the importance of CDX and PNMP in the use of uh, our uh, data practice. And you can see that the CDX is mainly used for anti resorptive monitoring and a PNMP can be used for both anti-resorptive as well as antibody therapy in our practice. Next up. But in order to use the markers and interpret them correctly, we need to know the biological and analytical variability of the bone markers. And these markers can be divided into the controllable and non-controllable. Next slide, please. A controllable, for example, the what time you take the uh, sample, and I got it a sample uh, after fasting of a meal. Uh, these are the one that actually patient related or subject related thing that we can control. Whereas there's also another list of those non controllable factors, which actually like patients' age and gender and so on. And the next two slides go to tell you all the highlighted importance of different factors that can affect the variability of our Ubuntu markers. Yeah, down next. This is a list to show you the sources of pre-analytical variability of bone markers. Back to the previous slide, yes. Circadian rhythm and uh, feeding status are the most, two most important factors you need to consider. And next. Under the uncontrollable factors, and we need to highlight the point on fractures. Next, Dom, yes. Now, very important for us to understand that if there is a recent fractures, and that because of it triggers off the bone or fracture healing casket, 
the bone trail marker is going to go up. So therefore, when we use turnover markers, bone turnover markers in our clinical practice, we have to know that whether patients have a recent fracture. Because the value that you get, if you do a bone turnover markers in the recent fractures, then it might not be the actual value that the patient has. So that's why it's not ideal to use that for a patient who has a recent fracture, even up to six months to one year of the last fractures. Next. You can see here, based on this graph on the right hand side, there's obvious difference uh, circadian variation at the level of bone turtle markers that we measure at a different time of the day, and we should deviate from the 24 hours mean value. And also looking at the fasting and non-fasting status, fasting reduces the fluctuation from the 24 hours mean value as well. So for collection of uh, sample for either the initial sample and the subsequent sample for monitoring, next, it is advisable to actually take a morning blood sample at eight o'clock and with a fasting uh, uh, sample as well. So that will minimize uh, further variability or any problem or mistakes that can, you know, related to the um, fasting status or the circadian rhythm. Next. As we mentioned earlier, Fracture increases bone turtle markers level, and it actually increases very largely and over the past few weeks. As stated in the slide here, PRNMP increased by the average of 52% four weeks after foreign fracture, 96% six weeks after the ankle fractures, and the bone airline phosphatase can even go up 200% 24 hours after the tibia fractures. Next. So therefore, it's actually when we use and use bone markers, and some of us try to use it for the fracture liaison service and so on, the patient comes to you with a recent fracture of the hip or the vertebra, and patients are captured into the FLS program. And you start to use bone markers to actually monitor your treatment effectiveness and so on. That might not be a ideal situation at all because the markers definitely will go up even the highest about three months and can even last for until one year. Next. And of course, we know that there are medical conditions that can affect the bone turtle markers level. There are also drugs that can affect the bone turtle markers, particularly cococorticoid therapy is the most important cause of secondary osteoporosis that we see in clinical practice because of suppression of the bone formation and uh, that can lead on to accelerated bone loss. So these drugs and diseases can actually affect the bone to our markers level. Next. CTX and PNMP have been selected and recommended by LF and also IFCC as a reference bone to markers based on the following criteria. It is adequately characterized and clearly defined and is bone specific. And it performed very well in predicting fracture risk and monitoring treatment. It has acceptable biological and analytical variability. And also the best actually the ideal should be obtained from the blood sample. And uh, it can be measured in the routine clinical labs using the automated assays and the ACs should be widely also available and not be the monopoly of a single supplier. Next. Bone turtle markers have been used for both risk assessment and the treatment for osteoporosis. Risk assessment include the prediction of bone loss. Some of the individuals are classified as fast bone loser and some are classified as slow bone loser, particularly those with very high resection markers they actually belongs to those who have fast bone loser. And therefore, that predict the higher fracture risk. With the unusually high bone turtle marker that you see, secondary osteoporosis has to be excluded before appropriate treatment is being initiated. Whereas on the treatment arm, individuals with high resolution markers are resp actually responding better with anti therapy. 
whereas the most established use of bone tumor markers is the monitoring of the response to treatment, in which we can identify responders, co-responders, and non-responders. It is also very helpful in identifying those with poor adherence and also compliance with treatment based on the changes on the levels of bone tumor markers. With the recent introduction of so-called drug holiday, you believe the concept of drug holiday. We know that some of us do not accept or believe the concept called drug holiday. But if, for whatever reason, because of the possible adverse effect of treatment and so on, and you decided to actually give the patient a drug holiday, bone tumor markers become very important tool and useful tool for us to see the offset of the effect of the treatment that you actually given to the patient and subsequently decided to stop. Next. Let's look at a few examples of using bone tumor markers in therapy monitoring. Next. This is a table to compare using bone mineral density and bone tumor markers in therapy monitoring. I think the biggest difference here is this. When we advise using bone mineral density to, to monitor the treatment effect, we only advise them to repeat the bone density after a year or two or even not three years after treatment because the least significant change that, you know, is, that is, uh, for the bone mineral density measurement is actually doesn't allow us to actually measure the, um, the changes within a year. Whereas um, for bone tumor markers, you can see the difference in terms of the marker levels even within 10 days, even within one month or three months. And you can see a big difference in terms of the changes and compared with the bone mineral density, you might only see a few percent within a year or two following treatment. So that makes a big difference in terms of using bone tumor markers or bone mineral density to monitor our effectiveness of treatment and the bone trauma markers definitely sounds more attractive in terms of you know, being used for these purposes. Next. Next down. Now, when we use anti-resorptive, no, before the previous slide, when we use or we start a patient on anti-resorptive therapy like bisphosphonate, reloxifen, and you can you, what you expect to see on the markers level is that there's a reduction of the CTX or the resorption markers and followed by the PNMP and this coupling effect. And that reduction in terms of the resorption markers can happen within weeks or within three months. Whereas when you start someone on anabolic therapy like teriprotide, you can see and expect to see a marked increase in the bone formation marker PNMP. Again, that's followed by an increase in the bone resorption markers because of the coupling effect. So for those who never actually started using bone tumor markers, if you put someone on teriprotide, don't be surprised that within a month or three, and your colleagues might tell you that there is an increase of 100 or 200 percent of the PNMP level. That can happen in anabolic therapy. So that's what we expect when you use either anti or anabolic therapy for our patient. And with that kind of reduction of resorption markers and increase in the reformation marker, that translates into a better bone sort of um, density and reduction of fracture risk. Next. And it is also shown that patients with the greatest reduction in bone tumor markers, which is happening in the highest total, either both the PNMP and CDX, and show the largest improvement of bone mineral density as well, as shown in the slides. Next. When we look at the uh, relationship between the vertebral fractures risk reduction, and this study of FN1 IF, IH bone quality study, it is shown clearly that a strong relationship between the uh, vertebral fracture risk reduction and the treatment related bone alkaline phosphatase or PNMP changes as well as shown here. Next. 
Whereas when we look at the intravenous thalidronate compare that with oral residronate for those glucocortical induced osteoporosis. Next, you can see a very marked and rapid reduction of resorption markers even within 10 days following an intravenous infusion of salidronate compared with the um, oral residronate. And then you also see that there's a delay in the response to the PNMP because they expect you get a reduction of resorption and followed by a reduction of PNMP as well because of the coupling effect as mentioned earlier. Next. Even using the reloxifen, which is a less potent anti therapy, you can see the rapid reduction of the um, resorption markers and PNMP following treatment. But being a less potent anti resorptive and the reduction of CTX and the PNMP will be lower than the one those being treated with bisorcinate or denosumab, which is a much more potent and resultive compared to reloxifen. Next. Whereas when we look at those treated with denosumab, and you can see the CTX level decreased to the level below the premenopausal reference interval just in about one month. And both TTX and PNNP remain below the premenopausal reference interval throughout six to 36 months. And more importantly, Bunto markers, and there was significant correlation between the CTX reduction and the bone mineral density increase. Next. And when we look at the offset of action, for those being treated with bisorcinate, and the point there is, upon stopping the bisnophonic treatment, the bone term markers level increased, but even after two years, they did not return to the pre-treatment level. But comparing that with the nosomat treated individual, after stopping treatment, the bone term markers rapidly increased, even above the baseline level. So when you off the treatment, you see the resorption marker increase immediately, but upon restarting the treatment, you see a immediate drop of the uh, resorption markers and those are the PNNP as well. So for those that are being treated with denosumab, when you're on treatment, off treatment, and on treatment back again, bone flow markers become a very important tool for us to see whether the patient actually responds to the treatment that you give with the changes of the markers that you see. Next. Patient adherence is always the issue. Next. One of the main concerns for patients treated with bisorcinate is the compliance and adherence. But yet, bisorcinate is also is still considered as the first line treatment in many clinical practice guidelines in many countries. And this is particularly true when a strict instruction has to be followed by patient. They have to be you know, taking um, empty stomach early in the morning and after taking it, get upright position. You're not allowed to lie down, not allowed to take anything within half an hour or one hour. With all this regular frequent dosing and all the strict instruction, many of patients who have been treated with sauce they actually stop treatment even within about six months of their treatment that given to them. So the many of them drop out even within six months. Next. So IOF and um, the European Classified Teacher Society recognize this problem. And uh, we know the adherence even less than 50%. With low adherence, of course, that translates to lack of efficacy and, of course, reduced cost effectiveness. Therefore, IOF and ECTS, next, set up a working group and uh, published an article, next, on the recommendation, next, uh, for the screening of adherence to oral bisorcinate. And this paper is actually based on next, the trial study, which is a response of bone tunnel markers to three oral bisorcinate therapy in postmenopausal osteoporosis. Next, trial is actually next, an open control trial comprising 172 postmenopausal osteoporosis women. They actually randomized to alindronate ibandronate and residronate group. And the biochemical responses to three oral resources were assessed. And the least significant change for each marker was derived within the study population. 
The reference intervals were obtained from the control group of healthy premenopausal women aged 35 to 40. Next. The picture here shows that the percentage change from the baseline for bone resorption markers, both CTX and NTX, for the three bisosonate studied under trial. And you can see that on the arrow, there's a marked reduction, a rapid reduction of those being treated with evandronate. And the CTX level go down to about 80%. And where similarly, as actually you can see on elindronate, where our residronate is about 60%. And you can also see the difference between the CTX and the NTX changes. So CTX is actually is a better markers compared to NTX when you use it clinically for monitoring resorption marker changes. Next. The next slide actually show the bone formation markers and such as alkaline phosphatase, the PNMP. And you can also see the reduction on the PNMP is very marked. And there's a delay you can see within the first four weeks compared with the uh, CDX, as might be earlier mentioned, the reduction of resorption markers, then later followed by a reduction of PNMP. And PNMP also can see that the changes is more obvious than the osicalcin and bone, the alkaline phosphatase. Next. The slide here show that the changes from baseline after three months of treatment is this three resource that they commonly use in clinical practice. On the left hand side is the changes on the CTX, uh, on the right hand side is the PNMP. You can see most of them actually within three months they actually drop down to the uh, level where more than the list of the chain for the markers and the shadow area is actually represent the list of the chain for the marker. And um, for the PNMP you can see it's actually below the 38% and whereas CTA is below 52% of the change in the, from the baseline. Next. And in this study, this slide also shows that most of the subjects have a CTX and PNMP level above the geometric mean, which is a red line here, but within the reference interval before treatment. And three months following treatment, both markers, CTX and PNMP, fell below the geometric mean, but stay within the lower half of the reference interval or below the lower limit of reference interval. In many other practice, some of us might think that in osteoporosis patient, the markers or the CTX, PNM, uh, particularly CTX, should be much higher than normal range uh, reference interval. That's actually not true. Many of our osteoporosis patient, their markers actually still within the normal reference interval, but at a higher level there. Next. The average decrease for the CTX actually from 68 to 81% and PNMP between 48 to 63%. Next slide, as indicated there, the next slides. Whereas next, the percentage of individual with a decrease beyond the list of change was actually 78 percent to 98 percent for CDX and 75 percent to 84 percent for BNNP. Next, as shown in next slide, text two slides here. Yeah, next. So based on the result, a screening strategy proposed. And after measuring Bunto markers before initiating medication, a second measurement is performed in three months. If the decrease does not exceed the least significant chain, the clinician should reassess the treatment, mainly the adherence, and eventually if an underlying cause of secondary osteoporosis is lower, a lower response to the drug has not been previously detected. Next. So this actually show the proposed strategy. When we have decided to start treatment, either based on bone mineral density or based on other risk factors and so on, we perform a baseline bone tunnel markers, either PNMP 
or CTX or both, and then you start the treatment. And three months later, you repeat the bone turnover markers. And if the bone turnover marker decreases, it's actually more than less than you can change. Yes, you continue treatment. But the bone turnover marker decreases less than less than you can change. It had reassessed the treatment. Is there any other issues that you have not addressed and identified? Or is it purely because of poor compliance and adherence? Next. This is actually the recommendation by IF and ECDS. And the findings of the trial study were used at this one. And uh, this is a very important guide for us. And you can see within three months, we can actually assess the Bunto markers changes and then we act on it. Rather than comparing using a bone with the density, you only see a few percent changes after two years. So Bunto markers assessment allow you a much earlier identification of those who respond or not responding to a treatment, those who are compliant or not here to a treatment or not, and also you act accordingly. Next. So after going through the first two parts, I think it's important to identify what's happening in Asia Pacific region. Next. And thanks a lot to uh, Professor Wu and his team from Taiwan, and who actually initiated this um, effort, and also inviting many of us to actually join the team and then come up with this consensus statement on the use of Ubuntu markers for short-term monitoring of osteoporosis treatment in the Asia Pacific region. It is published last year in the Journal of Clinical Densimetry. Next. And it actually looks at uh, 12 different countries, the different guidelines, and of course, we cannot go through every single of them. Now, briefly from the Australian side, okay, it identified the importance of bone formation markers of PNMP and the resumption marker of CTX. An important point here is actually the reimbursement by the National Healthcare Insurance. Next. The second country where it is actually reimbursable is actually from China, where the Chinese Society also produces a bone mineral research guideline. Again, bone markers help clinicians identify the primary and secondary osteoporosis condition, predict the speed of bone loss, evaluate risk of bone fractures, and choose a medication to enhance the patient compliance. And again, I recommend PNMP and CTX. Next. So the next country actually recognizes the importance of this and is reimbursable based on the National Health Insurance in Japan. And the guideline proposed the use of bone metabolic markers in the consideration into the current health insurance regulation. And the periodic repeated measurement for monitoring was actually important and effective. Next. And of course, our friend from Southeast Asia, Thailand, also recommend for risk assessment and also follow up, and but it's not recommended for diagnosis. And these four countries, fortunately, is that the uh, national health care insurance can they can actually reimburse the uh, the cost for a bone tone markers next. Hong Kong stress a point important is the changes in bone tone markers are much more rapid than bone mineral density, and uh, a short term reduction of BTN actually correlate with the longer term of BND response to treatment and reduction of fractures. So there's emerging support for the use to monitor treatment response, especially within the first three to six months. Next. And for the Indian, the Rheumatology Association for Glucocortical Induced Osteoporosis is also actually clearly identified the importance of using Bunto markers and a particular early detection of the treatment response. Next. Indonesia, the indication of markers are meant to identify patients with osteoporosis risk, rapid bone loss, 
predict femur fracture risk, monitor patient long-term therapy, and so on. And again, it's actually used to evaluate treatment responses. Next. And our country, back home Malaysia, yeah, our CPG identified the importance of BTN is useful to identify patients at high risk of facial fractures and can be used to evaluate treatment efficacy and compliance of treatment, but we do not recommend the use to use or diagnosis osteoporosis. And changes in the level can be seen within three to six months after initiation of drug therapy. Next. And New Zealand, same thing, it also identified the level of changes that is actually shown to be significant. And uh, even at certain level, the actually oral resource in it might not be optimal. They might even actually change, switch over to IV resource in it. Next. And the Philippine, Vintero marker should not be used in the diagnosis and is meant to use assess adherence to and also the effectiveness of therapy. Next. Next slide. Yes. And Is Singapore also stress a point of monitoring therapeutic response and is not a diagnostic tool. It is an aid to fracture risk assessment, prediction of rate of bone loss, as well as monitoring response to treatment. Next. And Taiwan, yes, again, CCX and PNMP can be utilized as monitoring, monitoring tool for separate treatment. So based on the 12 countries, you can see that Four of them actually are uh, uh, the bone markers can be reimbursed on the health national healthcare insurance, but not the rest of the country's region. So with that uh, overview of the guidelines for different countries of region, next. The group actually has recommended some consensus statements here. And the first is actually we should endorse the use of bone tail markers, especially CTX and PNMP as a short-term monitoring tool for osteoporosis treatment and is consistent with the recommendation from other groups. Second, next. Bone tone markers can be used to differentiate patients with relatively high or lower bone tunnel rates and therefore helping the clinician to choose an appropriate anti-osteoporosis treatment regimen. Next. Bone tail markers can reflect the therapeutic responses to anti therapy earlier than BNB and therefore help both in selecting osteoporosis treatment and in assessing its responses to therapies. Next. And absolute values or the degree of change from baseline of bone tail markers can be used to monitor the efficacy of osteoporosis therapy clinically. Next, CTX and or P1MP can be used to evaluate patient adherence and drug responses to antidotoxic agents and measurement. It depends on your practice is recommended as baseline three months, six months and 12 months after starting treatment. Next. Whereas PNNP can be used to evaluate patient adherence and drug responses to anabolic agents and again, the same measurement regime. Next. And of course, the important point is to encourage reimbursement on bone tone markers by different health insurance program in the Asia Pacific to improve patient adherence and treatment outcome. Next and recommend appropriate use of bone markers as a short-term monitoring tool for improving the use of therapeutic regimens in osteoporosis care. And this point actually has stirred some of the arguments as we mentioned earlier. For those patients who get captured into FLS when it's a recent fractures, you have to be more careful with when to use BTM, the bone markers. As we say, the bone markers will go up following the fractures. But for those who actually 
had a fracture more than about a year ago and they identified them in their, clinic, in their clinics, in the hospital, in the ward, and so on, that that, that actually grew a patient. There's no issue of using wound tumor markers as a short-term monitoring tool. Next. So with that summaries that they have for the Asia Pacific group, the conclusion is that the use of wound tumor markers can be incorporated in treatment algorithm of osteoporosis care program to improve patient adherence and treatment outcome and encourage a sufficient reimbursement for healthcare system may facilitate more widespread use of bone tumor markers in clinical practice in the AP region. Next. Now, I have actually next three slides and those patients that under my care, and uh, I actually divided into three reloxifen treated patients, the uh, residronate treated patient and alindronate. I actually uh, pluck out five um, patients from each group. And uh, the stage when the time when I was using bad boon, the CTX, osacalcin, and PNMP, you can see that before treatment, after three month treatment, what's the changes here? And on the CTX, you can see the changes actually very inconsistent there. Whereas osacalcin, you can see the reduction about 20 or 30, 40%, and PNMP also in that range. Because reloxifen is actually a less potent antiresorptic compared to bisorcinate. So whatever changes you see on CTX, PNMP, it might go down by 30, 40%. Next. The next five patients actually treated under the residronic group. And again, before treatment, after three months, you can see the CTX, osacalcin, and PNMP and a marked reduction in terms of the, uh, the level of those bone markers. As I said earlier, the residronate, arindronate belongs to the resorcinate, which is actually much more potent and resorty. So we expect to see about even 60 to 80 percent of reduction of these kind of markers after three months of treatment. Next. So the next table shows another five patients of mine being treated with alindronate. Again, we monitor after three months of treatment, you can see the changes, go to 80, 70, 80 percent average in terms of the reduction of all the markers there. So with this kind of result, you see one patient, they do a baseline. Three months later, patient gone for another test and the patient actually see the reduction and that should be much easier for a clinician to convince the patient to tell you that your actually blood test show yeah, actually a reduction of markers, which is good and just exactly what we want to achieve. That helps a patient to accept and to believe and to actually adhere to the treatment that you actually recommend to them. So that really helps a lot in improving compliance and adherence. Next. Next slide, you can see that you only see the figures on the Malaysian uh, figures. And I try to gather all the other costs of doing a BTS, a BTM or Buntal markers in this region. Because I think for the industry, they feel a bit sensitive that they cannot review what the charges in different country. So I only can share with you what happened in Malaysia. Based on this list that reviewed by the Asia Pacific Group led by Professor Wu, you can see four country get reimbursement, the rest no. But you look at Malaysia, for the CTX, the lowest chance of CTX blood test is actually 20 to 30 US dollar and can even go up to one of the highest the lab that charges 85 US dollar. But average about 20 to 30 dollars or 40 dollars. PNMP again 30 to 45 dollars US dollar. Also calcium about 25 to 40 US dollar. And compare that with the DEXA scan that we do here in hip and spine also cost about 30 to 60 US dollar. So the charges, the cost for bone term markers in fact not too high, in fact, might be same or lower than the bone density that we ordered. So it is not limited to just research purposes. In fact, in Malaysia, the one lab doing routinely a serum CTA for those ladies who go for a health screening test, whereas others actually on request purposes, it costs them about, let's say, 20 to 40, 50 dollars per test. And you only do a test at a baseline three months, maybe six months or nine months later. So in terms of cost, 
it's not too bad, in fact, for uh, at least for Malaysia. For other countries, I really can't comment on this point because I do not have the data from the other countries. Next. So, so with that, I think uh, I will end the session. And uh, as I said, we've gone through three different parts of the session. And hopefully that gives some, um, um, some um, points and some uh, understanding of the use of Bundo markers and what's happening in the Asia Pacific region. And thank you very much for taking your time to join this webinar session. Yes, Dominic. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for your talk and covering the bone turnover markers and their use for monitoring treatment. And thanks for highlighting what is happening in Asian countries and for showing some clinical cases, which I'm sure was appreciated by our audience. Um, now I would like to move on to question as we have received a number of them during the presentation. So maybe I will start with this uh, question. Like you have mentioned, like if blood tests are too expensive or are not reimbursed by health insurance in my country, is it possible to, mm -hmm. measure, to measure only one marker? And if yes, which one would you suggest? Yes, I think using one marker is adequate. And for those being treated with uh, entry resorty, like bisorcinate and so on, it makes sense that, you know, we actually do a resorption marker because we want to see how much drop the resorption marker, like CTX. But knowing the characteristic and the feature of CTX and PNMP, PNMP is less affected by the um, circadian rhythm and by food intake. So in clinical practice, many of us prefer to use a PNMP if you want to use only one, even to monitor the patient who are actually on anti -resorptive. So absolutely possible that you can actually limit your measurement on one markers and both CTX or PNMP. It depends on how comfortable you are with the, uh, in, as I say, circadian rhythm and a food intake status. Thanks. Uh, another question. Can bone, of, bone turnover markers be an indicator for drug holiday before five years uh, treatment? Well, um, really, um, if let's say for those who started on bisorcinate and continue for five years, and after five years, you worry about the risk of the FFN and ONJ might increase, you decided to give the patient a drug holiday. And that's the time you might you want to do a bone mineral density as well as a, the bone tunnel markers. And following that, you monitor the bone tunnel markers again. So that's actually feasible, that's possible in terms of using that to monitor for those uh, who do have drug holiday, even after five years of bisorcinate treatment. Thanks. Uh, another question, if CTX or and PINP assays are not available in my country, which other markers would you recommend to follow over the treatment period? Um, if CDS and PNP are not available, might be uh, bone specific alkaline phosphatase is one of the choice. And it's more commonly available for alkaline phosphatase, but you know, knowing that this, uh, you have to, have to identify or to use the bone specific alkaline phosphatase. Okay. I have another question. Um, uh, as a patient, can I ask my physician to perform blood tests to reassure me that I'm responding to the treatment? Yes. Now, I think uh, in terms of treatment, and it's very important to have the communication and so understanding and the trust between the clinician and the patient. So when we actually discuss about treatment, you should actually tell the patient exactly what the treatment is all about and then how to know that whether this treatment is really effective. You should actually explain to the patient that you know you can either use the bone mineral density, which only shown the result after about two years. And there's another way of actually doing a blood test. 
And nowadays, patients, they do come to request a blood test to see the effectiveness. Of course, we respect the patient request. And in fact, there's actually a very important way you keep the communication and understanding between the clinician and patient. So if patient requests for the blood test to see the effectiveness of treatment, tell them you either do a baseline, repeat three months later, or the other way. So that's important. Yes, absolutely. And that's maybe uh, the main one. Uh, what can we do to get the health authorities to reimburse blood tests? I think we have to present in terms of the cost of each blood test in different country. If a blood test, the cost for the Bunto markers is same, or even lower the bone density, I think that is a very important plus point where the local society, the national society can actually recommend that. And also put that under the uh, national guideline and with the uh, awareness and promotion of the uh, involvement of the health authority in terms of awareness, treatment and so on, bone terminal markers should be actually lumped together is as one package that you present to the health authority. So they accept the whole thing, the markers as part of patient care, part of things that can, can it convince the patient compliance and adherence so that the treatments are effective and that reduces further fractures and that's actually good for the health authority. Uh, thanks. And now it's I think it's time to conclude. So thank you very much for your participation in this webinar. And thank again, Dr. Lee. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this session. We will post recordings of this webinar on the IOF website, as well as you will receive an email with the link to the registered webinar to the slides and to other IOF resources related to this topic. You will be prompted to fill in a survey immediately after this webinar. We would appreciate your input and comments as we continue, continuously try to deliver the webinars that meet your needs. Last but not the least, if you have any questions, comments, please do not hesitate to send them over to webinar at iofbonehealth.org. And thanks again, Dr. Lee, for your very nice uh, lecture. I think this was very a very good one. And uh, goodbye to everybody. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, all friends. Thank you.